Have you ever thought of moving somewhere else? Maybe to a new country where your future is less predictable, but the thrill of having that clean slate to work with excites more than the fear of moving somewhere else. In uh, 2006, uh, I packed my bags and I moved from a predictable and comfortable life in Stockholm uh, to a very different culture, to a new language and a very unknown future in Hong Kong. I started a business that works with insight, design and innovation and uh, for China facing companies. I lived there now 12 years and I'm starting to feel at home. Uh, the jaw-dropping speed of its development keep me quite excited. I first started to visit China in 2003. Uh, I did these trips because it was and still is where the majority of our products are being manufactured. But uh, more and more uh, of the global brands are now also moving over research centers to this part of the world and the association to cheap manufacturing is uh, being challenged. My frequent travels between East and West made me see globalization at the front line. I was part of it. Uh, at the time I was thinking a lot how that affected me, my role as a designer and us and the rest of the world. Today's products are often designed in one country, they're developed in the second, they're manufactured in the third, and they're sold in the fourth. It happens because economies develop in different phases, and that drives an international fragmentation of our production. Now, uh, this also increases our need for a cross-cultural engagement. It challenges us to understand and work with cultures that are very different from our own. Early on, I understood that the speed of the development in China would change something. I didn't really know what, where, or, or how, but I understood one thing. I needed to be there, and I needed to be in the midst of it. Now, let me give you a little background because it's not the first time I've moved abroad. I'm born in Gothenburg and my family moved early on to, to the US. Me and my sister, we had to practice a new language and make new friends. I remember being utterly disappointed when landing in New York as a five-year-old and not seeing any of the animals I predicted. Buffaloes and cougars, there were painfully absent. Disappointed, I was thinking, this looks like home. But uh, it all worked out fine, and I found new friends. Uh, I learned to speak a second language very early on. Now, after a few years, we moved back to Gothenburg, and a new school, new friends, and for me, a, a new culture. Uh, we bought a house close to the harbor in Gothenburg, and it made me develop a very thick Gothenburg dialect. Then, in the 80s, we moved again, now up here to the north. Uh, again, new friends, a new school. Quickly, I had to brush off the thick Gothenburg dialect to learn the new from the north. As a child, you don't really think about this. Uh, you just, it's just a part of your life. Uh, you just try to fit in. Our natural instinct to adopt to new situations are remarkable at this age. You pick up a new language in a couple of months and you change one dialect from the one day to the next. At this age, I didn't really realize it, but the changing environment was setting seeds within me. Borders started to blur, and friends and familiar places took its place. Moving wasn't so hard. Now, in 2000, I graduated from the Design Institute in Numeo. 
I landed my new job in Italy, outside Venice. I was working for a famous Italian sports brand. Again, a new language, new friends, as usual, but I was getting used to it. Arriving to 2006 and facing the opportunity to move to Hong Kong, well, you can imagine the decision wasn't that hard. It marked a new chapter in my life, but it followed a familiar pattern. The fear of something new was gone and replaced with the thrill and excitement of a new experience. Now, the area that I'm talking about now will be the one you see behind me, uh, and the specifically the green dot, which is called the China Greater Bay. All these past experiences of change helped me to assimilate to a very new and very different culture in Hong Kong. Instead of differences, I focused on similarities. I relied on my own network from one part of the world to connect me with the other. I looked for similar people with similar situation to help me, to guide me. I was positive. I was open to unfamiliar ways. In the same way as I dropped my thick Gothenburg language, I was now starting to drop some familiar Western habits. I was starting to eat with chopsticks. I greeted people without the familiar handshake. I shrunk my personal space from a very Swedish one meter almost down to zero. It's more a Hong Kong phenomenon with its high population density. Did you know that, for example, if we would take the same population density as they have in Hong Kong and apply it to Sweden, we would be 3.5 billion. There are, of course, challenges. Some of the trickier cultural differences are to adhere to is the hierarchy, the, the keeping face and, and the feng shui. They're deeply rooted in a nation culture, and it's hard to decipher as a Westerner. By understanding these deep cultural differences from both sides, uh, I can better understand where behaviors and attitudes come from. It helps me to empathize with the user, and that also makes me a better designer. Now... There was nothing random about me moving to Hong Kong. I had seen something that uh, during my travels that I wanted to position myself in a location where I can be a connector between Sweden and Hong Kong. The thoughts of globalization that I talked about earlier had uh, developed into a research report. I came with the investment banking of two of the biggest innovation and design agencies in Stockholm. I came to set up a studio in Hong Kong and connecting with the surrounding environment. Now, what interested me with this uh, region was the innovation cluster that was starting to be developed in and around Hong Kong. Uh, when I arrived in 2006, it was still called the Pearl River Delta, but, uh, and that included Hong Kong, Shenzhen, and Dongguan on the east side of the bay, Guangzhou, Suhai, and Macau on the west. Uh, when it occurred in, in uh, the central government's five-year plan, it was renamed, and now it was called China Greater, Na Greater Bay. Now, uh, this name more clearly spells out its, amb its ambition. Now, uh, we see these innovation clusters all over the world. Maybe Silicon Valley is the most famous of them, but there are others. We have uh, Tokyo Bay, we have uh, New York Greater Area, we have London. They're all grouping together talent and technology to forge a stronger and more competitive global offer. They're often similar in structure. They have an attractive education center. They are technology rich. They are supported by a large corporation and access to venture capital to uh, 
support a healthy base of startups. With its diverse structure, many are predicting that this area, China Greater Bay, will emerge as the largest cluster economy in the world by 2030. Now, it, it consists of three jurisdictions and 11 economies. Hong Kong and Macau, as you know, uh, supports this one country, two system philosophy. Today, this area generates 1.4 trillion US dollars. That's 12% of China's economy. It's home to only 5% of its population, though. And uh, maybe you have seen the, the reports coming out from Wired magazine about the innovation culture coming up and growing up in Shenzhen. Shenzhen, Shenzhen spends 4% of its GDP for, to reach research and development. That's uh, double the China average. In Shenzhen alone, you find some of China's absolute top tech giants. WeChat, which is a combination of Facebook, WhatsApp, and e-payment. We have Huawei, which develops telecom and the phones that you might have in your hand today. BGI, which is China's largest biotech company. And DGI, which manufactures and designs affordable drones. It also houses advanced, the most advanced production. Foxconn is probably the first company in China moving into manufacturing 4.0. And also that is the developer and manufacturer of the iPhone and the iPad. There are research centers in this area from a large Western, many Western brands like Harman Kardon or Microsoft. They all have their centers here. Now, Shenzhen probably owes its success to go beyond the planned economy and its close relationship to Hong Kong. Because in Hong Kong, you find a mix of a Western culture, common law, freedom of speech, a finance center, and an English-speaking workforce. It will be a natural location for more companies who are involved in the professional service industry or in finance. The crazy thing with this area is its density. Nowhere else in the world will you find four megacities so close to each other. You have Hong Kong with 7 million. You have Shenzhen with 12 million. You have Dongguan with 8 million. And you have Guangzhou with 14 million people. The whole area here has 70 to 80 million people living within it. Now, one of the objectives here is to allow land travel between all of these cities in this area within one hour. The infrastructure is now currently being built. The bridge between Hong Kong and Macau will open the 1st of July. The last link to uh, China's fast speed network, train network, will uh, open in September. Now, there are, of course, other factors that are key for a successful innovation cluster. Uh, Richard Florida, an American economist, speaks about the importance of attracting the creative class. The innovators themselves, which uh, look for similar-minded people to connect with. These uh, are professional. They include working with healthcare and business and finance. They draw from a network to solve specific problems within a high degree of education to do so. These successful clusters around the world manage to attract these top-level knowledge workers. They offer a large div diversity. They offer an engaging culture and uh, a technology-rich technology environment. Either they work for leading corporation or tap into the venture capital to launch their own startup. In recent years, you have seen the growth of these incubators in Hong Kong and Shenzhen to this new workforce. 
the common perception that China might be incapable innovation needs to be thoroughly re-examined. Now, adding to this, we have the China Belt and Road Initiative. This will also play a key role in the development of this Greater Bay Area. It drives growth to the region, and many reports predict that China will surpass the U.S. in 2023 as the largest economy in the world. I chose to arrive early to this region. I wanted to grow with it. I predict that the world will look very different in a not-so-distant future. Changes will come faster and then we will have the ability to, to adopt to. Many are expecting China to become one of the economic poles in the global market, whether we like it or not. The only thing that's constant with the future is its change. Now, your change might be different from my change, but we have to learn to see the opportunities in change and not to fear them. So my advice to you is be flexible, be open-minded. The choice is yours. Thank you very much. <laughs>